Let us pray together. Gracious God, thank you for the wonder of inviting us into your presence, that we are here as children, as your children. Open our hearts and our minds to both who you are and who we are in you. Make room, Lord, in our hearts for that which you would desire to impart to us, our hearts and our minds. Work through us as you see fit. And so we do say, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and King, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. On this very cloudy and cool morning, I want to thank you for getting up in time to be able to attend this service at, at 8.45. I, I get up really early, particularly since my body is still on Eastern time, but I still kind of feel like, oh yeah, it's time to wake up, isn't it? And we've got a church service to do. I want to talk to you a little bit about Christ the King, because quite honestly, it's not a subject that we sort of are used to. We talk a lot about what it means for Jesus to come into your heart and into your life. And he does that, deeply committed to that. In fact, he, when he comes inside of us, forms an organic bond. So that when he says things like, lo, I am with you always, or Paul writes, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. He's not talking about Jesus adjacent. What he's really talking about is Jesus in us or an organic unity, I in them and they in me, Jesus prays in the Gospel of John. But having said yes to that, having said yes to him coming into the deepest parts of our heart, make no mistake, he's here to claim us as his own, all of us. Adam Kuyper puts it this way, No single piece of our mental world is to be hermeneutically sealed off from the rest. And there is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry out, mine. To say that we belong to him is in fact a claim that enfolds all of who we are our relationships, what happens in this mental world of ours, the way we form our time, the way we spend our money, the way we organize things, the way we have our friendships and our relationships. Jesus as King and Lord over all claims all of it for himself, but for only one purpose, actually two. The first is to build into us a profound place of love and safety, to know that He is in us, and it is a bond that will never, ever be dissolved. He will never let us go, so that no matter what it is that we go through and endure, the ups and downs of life, all of that, tragedies as well as wonderful joys, none of that actually shifts or changes in a way that begins to pull as a tension between us and Jesus. There is a solidity that he has placed within us because that's who he is. If he were not king and sovereign Lord over all, he could not do that within us because there could be some force coming at us on the outside that could challenge that kind of relationship and often does. And if Jesus isn't at every moment saying, no, you belong to me, or to those that would come against us, particularly the forces of the spiritual world, Jesus saying, no, this one is mine. You cannot have this one. So that's meant to provide for us a sense that, okay, God, if you are Lord and King over all, and you will never let me go, that means I can trust you. And that I can walk with you knowing that you will never let me go. And that I'm always going to be right in the palm of your hand. 
but also giving us that kind of inner assurance, that sort of safety that gives us the capacity that we would not have on our own, that quells the fears, that builds up inside of us a sense of confidence so that we really can be available for God to use us in the lives of other people. We're not sort of, as Kuiper says, have a Christian faith that is, as it were, hermeneutically sealed off so that all of my, my dealings in my social life and in how I spend money is, is like disconnected from that, as if somehow this is my spiritual life, but, but this is the real world and it's different out here. It is different out here, but the task is to bring into the specters of where we live what it means even there to serve, to serve, hear the word, to serve as a follower of Jesus and to be available in any way that he sees fit. And that means if I'm in a restaurant, if, I mean, if I'm in a boardroom, if I'm at the gas station, I mean, my wife jokes about it. She says, you know, my husband has a ministry to waiters. And, and because what happens is, you know, somebody will come to the table and he will say hello. And particularly if it's a more informal place, he'll say, you know, my name is Jim and I'm here to serve you this evening. And I go, hi, Jim. How are you? And he doesn't quite know how to handle that because that's not often asked of him. And so we talk a little bit. There have been times where I've literally pulled Jim, whomever that might be, aside before we left the restaurant and heard something out of his heart. I mean, people, many people, you never know who they are, are in fact genuinely longing to be known. And that's our joy. That is our joy to be available like that. Let me tell you a, a pretty extreme but striking story. One of my heroes is a guy named Tony Campolo. Tony Campolo taught sociology at Eastern University outside of Philadelphia for a very long and, in fact, storied career. But what really put him on the map was his radical approach to the Christian faith. And he wrote books like The Kingdom of God is a Party, and another one, Who Switched the Price Tags? And what he's talking about is what happens when a person who's been raised in church really begins to face the kind of challenging and exciting claims of the gospel. It's like, how come I didn't hear this before? So he tells this story, and I've heard him tell it in person. And somebody posted it on YouTube this week, and I thought, oh, yeah, I remember that. And here's the story. I've transcribed a little bit of it. I can't tell it with his flair. So and besides, that would take the entire sermon. So here's the, here's the gist, as it were. He had been invited to speak in Honolulu at a concert, at a conference out there. Having flown from the East Coast through several time changes, he woke up at three in the morning. He was hungry. He didn't know what to do. The restaurant downstairs was closed. So he thought, I gotta get up. So he threw his clothes on, went downstairs, walked down the street, ended up at one of these all night greasy spoon diners that appeared to be the only thing open where he was. There were not even tables. There was like, you walked in, it was small, there's a counter, about 10 little sort of turnstile bar stools, and a guy behind the counter. So they begin to talk and eventually orders what he what felt like safe. He, could, he looked at the menu and he said, it was so greasy, I didn't even want to pick it up. And he ordered himself a donut and a coffee. So he's munching on his coffee and his donut, and this is at this point about 3.30 a.m. And who should come into the restaurant but 10 prostitutes? And they're laughing and they're talking to each other and they come in and all of a sudden they sit down and there's some on his right and there's some of his left. It's just 10 prostitutes and Tony Campolo. He said, I tried to make myself disappear. There was nothing that I could do and they're chatting and laughing and it's raucous and it's raw and back and forth. And then finally, the woman sitting to his right says, you know, Tomorrow's going to be my birthday. I'll be 39. And the woman sitting next to him and said, well, you know, in a very kind of cynical, dark way, well, what do you want me to do? Throw a party? He said, no. and she laughed and she said, no, I've never had a birthday party. So I'm sure not expecting one now. And they sort of got up and they began to wander around. 
That struck Tony to the core. And he turned around to the guy behind the counter, who's sort of the, a one-man manager, et cetera. And he said, tell me about the woman on my right. He said, oh, that's Agnes. She's been here a long time. Everybody knows Agnes. And he said, what if we were to throw her a birthday party? And the guy looked at him like he was crazy. And then he said, oh, that's a phenomenal idea. Let's do it. So Tony went out. He bought all these decorations. I mean, it wasn't a very big place. Big sign he put up on the mirror behind the counter. Happy birthday, Agnes. Streamers, balloons. The cook had a cake. And sure enough, at about the same time, oh, the other thing that happened was that word got out that they were going to throw a birthday party for Agnes. So by 3 a.m., when Tony arrived to decorate, he said it looked like half the prostitutes in Honolulu were crammed into this little diner. And so they put all of this stuff up, and, and they kind of wait for Agnes and her friends to arrive. And sure enough, right on the dot, they come in, and everybody shouts, Happy birthday, Agnes! And they're cheering. She dissolves in tears. This had never happened to her before. And she sat down, and they brought down the cake. And, and the guy behind the counter is, Well, Agnes, it's lit. Blow the candles out. And she really can't emotionally do it. This has never happened to her. <laughs> and finally, he blew the candles out. And he said, here's the knife. Cut the cake, Agnes. And she turns to Tony and she said, can I not cut the cake right now? And, and there was a childlikeness about her voice that he didn't hear at all last night. And he said, Agnes, it's your cake. You can do whatever. She said, I want to show it to my mother. She only lives two doors down. I, I promise, I'll be right back. And she picks it up, and he says she picked it up like the Holy Grail and carried it out, and sure enough, she was back like in 10 minutes. But after she left, the whole place was dead silent. And Tony is an extrovert in the extreme. He doesn't like quiet at all. And he's like, what do I do? And he finally, he spoke in and he said, you know, I think we ought to pray for Agnes. So he starts praying for Agnes out loud. Remember, it's just Tony and all these prostitutes. And he's praying for God to break into her life and bring her the love of Jesus and heal the woundedness in her heart and all the things that led her into this terrible, broken life that she lives. And after he finished praying, the guy behind the counter said, wait a minute, I thought you told us last night that you were a sociologist. You're not a sociologist, you're a preacher. And the guy says, no, I do a little bit of both. And, and then the guy said, what kind of church do you go to? Because I don't know a church that does what you do. And he said, and he said it was like a moment of inspiration. He said, you know what kind of church I go to? I go to a church that's full of people that do things like throw parties for prostitutes at three in the morning. And it was like a breakthrough happened. Because their perception of church was not anything like that at all. Their perception of church was conformity, and they sure as heck wouldn't fit in. And what Tony did, in a way that for me really demonstrates what this is all about, is that in a way that was tangible, knowable, he brought the love of Jesus Christ to that group of women in that, in that diner. And that's what this is about. You see, if you don't believe that Jesus came to claim every inch of your life and every inch of this world for himself, you will always hide out. There will always be this disparity between what you know of your faith and what it means to live in the world. And you will hate the fact that there will be a distinction and compromises and, you know, I don't have to do this do, if I'm a Christian, how, how do I do this? But what, all, what other choices do I have? And it produces a kind of interior guilt that plays upon itself so that your Christian life is ruled about things like, well, what will people think of me? But if you know that he's the Lord over the whole earth, including Lord over the diner in Honolulu, or wherever you are, that means you're walking into a place where Jesus is. 
even if it's dark, and I mean spiritually dark, he's still there as Lord over all, and you can be available for him to use you wherever you are. And you can do it with a level of courage, a level of ease, and a level of joy because you're not there for yourself. What's the scripture line? That we may live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died for us and rose again. And you begin to think about all of the aspects of your life, who you are as a human being, how you relate to people. If you're married, your relationship between you and your spouse. If you're a parent, how you are raising your kids. All from the perspective of how do I do this as a servant of Jesus? because he loves these people more than I do, and I want to be available. So, beloved, what I, what I want to challenge you to think about this morning is what difference would it make in your life, or does it make in your life, if you honestly believed that Jesus is the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords, including the Lord of Wall Street, including the Lord of fashion, including the Lord of medicine, including the Lord of pop culture, and all of the various places where we find ourselves involved. So that wherever you are, you're his. Because, beloved, isn't that what Jesus has done for you? That wherever you are, and no matter your circumstances, if, even if you really mess up royally, he never walks away and goes, that's too big for me to handle. No, he's the king. And because he's the king, he will guide you, take care of you, and provide for you, even in the worst circumstances of your own making. This isn't about, you see, trying to measure up. Just the opposite. It's about learning how to give away. And you can do that if you honestly believe that Jesus is king. Amen.